Hey everybody and welcome back to Virtual Berlin Tours with me Nick Jackson. I'm in Berlin where I live and today's story is going to be about um, the period after World War II known as the Cold War. It's going to be about spies and secret tunnels um, used by the West to spy on the Soviets um, as the Cold War got very warm in the beginning of the 1950s. And this story was inspired by the death of one of the most famous spies, a man who would work for the Special Intelligence Service, the SIS, so British Secret Service, during the height of the Cold War here in Berlin and elsewhere. A man who died a couple of weeks ago in Moscow at the age of 98, and the name of that man was George Blake. Where George Blake is now, I'm not really sure. Who knows, maybe he's here. The Ninth Circle of Hell, according to Dante in his famous poem, uh, the Inferno, the lowest circle of hell, a place of infinite darkness, an ice formed by the flapping of Satan's wings, is reserved for people who betray their uh, family, um, their peoples, their countries. So maybe that's where he is now, hanging out with people like Brutus, famed for stabbing Julius Caesar, or even Judas, from New Testament Jesus betrayal fame. Either way, wherever he is now, it's an interesting story. George Blake, the Cold War spies and the secret spy tunnel in Berlin that became known as Operation Gold. So let's kind of set the scene. Now, George Blake was an interesting character. Um, his, he was actually originally Dutch. His mother was Dutch. His father was Egyptian. But he fled Nazi Germany as a resistance member, crossed Europe and ended up in Britain. He became a nat naturalised British citizen and started to work um, within the military intelligence. Really, as a result, um, he was an attractive candidate for them because of his language skills. He got sent to Cambridge University um, and learned Russian and ended up in Korea where he was captured. Now, it's possible, he would say later, that this was this sort of crucial turning point. Either because he was captured and interrogated by the Russians to save his own skin, he said, I'll tell you what, let me go and I'll be a double agent working for you. Or, he would also sort of imply that he saw the behaviour of the Western forces in Korea and he decided that the side of the Cold War, the good guys, if you like, that he was going to serve, would be the Soviets. Eventually, um, to great fanfare, he was released from his incarceration, he was brought back to the UK and he started a spy for the Soviets and he would give some of the most crucial secrets away to the Soviets and eventually betraying hundreds by his own admission of agents who disappeared in the darkness beyond the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, all of which almost certainly lost their lives. But the story that he was most involved in was this famous spy tunnel here in Berlin dug from the west into communist East Berlin to listen to the phone lines and that's the story of Operation Gold that we're going to think about today. So our story really begins in 1949. Now in 1949, post-World War II, Europe had kind of crystallised. East and West Germany by the autumn of 1949 had been um, officially declared and Berlin West had now become an island of freedom in the sea of what was then communist East Germany. Berlin survived the blockade, 1948 to 1949. Soviets tried to block access to West Berlin, this island of freedom, and it was supported by aircraft, the largest movement of stuff the world has ever seen using aircraft, 2,348,000 tonnes of stuff. Everything you needed to support just under 2 million West Berliners for just over a year was flown into West Berlin. A famous Tempelhof Airport was the core of the airlift um, or the air bridge. Then slightly more forgotten things had uh, also occurred and one sent a sort of a tsunami of shock through the British and American secret services trying to get a handle as the Cold War in 1949 got warmer and warmer. What is happening on the other side of the Iron Curtain? What are the Soviets um, and other communist satellite countries up to? Are they about to launch World War III? By the end of the autumn 1949, the Russians had tested their first nuclear missile. That was a huge shock in the, uh, Washington, in London and elsewhere. People are thinking, why don't we know about that in advance? Where are we going to get the information? What are they going to do now that they've got the bomb? But a slightly more forgotten uh, um, event became known as Black Friday. And that was as a result of a highly placed Soviet mole in American Secret Service in Washington. The Soviets were informed that British and American Secret Service agents had managed to crack some of the ciphers and codes that the Russians were using. So as a result of that, the Russians changed all their codes. And suddenly, we've got no idea of what's happening east of the Iron Curtain. So as a result of that knowledge, the Russians also um, changed a policy. And what they decided to do was thinking that even if we change our ciphers and codes, radio traffic and other communications methods are too vulnerable. So what we're going to do is start using the landlines. So check this out. This is the telephone and it comes from a building that served as the American command center for the American sector of West Berlin during the Cold War. I liberated this before the building was shut. Now it's luxury apartments. 
click here, it's actually got a little label on it. It says, um, keep it short, keep it secure, because every time you picked up this phone to call, who knows, maybe other members of the uh, American military occupation in West Berlin, or the Brits, or the French, or even the CIA, you never quite knew who was listening. So the choice of using the landlines was crucial and starting in 1950 um, an operation called Conflict began organized by the British Secret Service and they decided that they were going to try and tap the landlines that the Russians were using in occupied Vienna. Operation Conflict developed into several short tunnels, the most famous of which um, that became known as Silver was um, dug from near a freight station on the Aspangstrasse in the southeastern suburb um, of Vienna. Um, the lines had been traced, they ran underground, they went close to um, the British sector, so from hiring a shop at this tunnel, Smoky Joe's as the agents called it, they dug a tunnel and started listening to the phone. Um, that was hugely successful, but eventually a tram travelling over the top of the tunnel kind of sunk and collapsed, and the whole Operation Conflict tunnel system um, was abandoned. But the technology had been developed to tap Soviet phone lines, um, and the idea of tapping landlines um, in Vienna it was then sort of migrated to Berlin, and in 1955, the most famous of the spy tunnels of the Cold War would be built, and that would become known as Operation Gold. So follow me. We're going to go down to a place called Altklinika, to a road called the Schönefelder Chaussee, under which ran these phone lines used by a crucially important Soviet military and military intelligence installations in Communist East Berlin, and we're going to walk the, um, the line of the tunnel, and I'll tell you the fantastic story of Operation Gold. George Blake, the Soviet spy um, in the British Secret Service, was the man who betrayed that to the Russians before it was even built. So I just slept down to uh, Glienicke. So we're in the bottom right-hand corner of, of Berlin. We're just inside the Western Zones. So where I'm standing now would have been um, the American sector. And it was right here behind me that the cover building for Operation Gold would have been constructed, finished, and operational from 1955. So this area here is the um, west. And just behind me over here, where the first few hundred meters of the tunnel would be, in a minute we'll go and walk the walk to the sector boundary. Sector boundary, Berlin Wall in 1961, uh, would have been just beyond these 1990s houses. So 1953 is where the planning stage for this tunnel uh, took place. That was a very important time in Berlin and divided Germany. Um, in 1953, in East Germany, um, there was an uprising. It increased the number of refugees coming out of East Berlin um, and uh, East Germany into the Western sectors to the Western Sector Reception Center at Marienfelder. Now, after Operation Silver and Operation Conflict, those tunnels in Vienna, the idea of tracing the phone lines and the technology, of course, had been developed as well. That idea migrates to Berlin. Uh, and using in the early 1950s people who were working in things like telephone exchanges, post offices, telecommunications, some very brave men and women, in fact, mostly women, were giving information um, to the Western uh, intelligence services in Berlin about which lines were being used by which East German or Soviet military um, or intelligence group. But this refugee uh, crisis, as East Germany would see it, these people coming through the reception centres at Marienfelder, those people were also interviewed because they might have had a specific job previously um, or a skill or knowledge that the Western intelligence services wanted. So those people were siphoned out. Some would also agree to work for Western intelligence as well. So a picture was built up of which lines in East Berlin and East Germany were being used by what organisation. And there were two crucial for the planning of Operation Gold and they were um, a place called Karlshorst in southeast Berlin, where um, an area of the suburb had been uh, siphoned off uh, and uh, fenced in. And within there, you had Soviet military intelligence, so KGB and Soviet military for occupied um, East Berlin and East Germany, so important. But perhaps even more crucial, they'd communicate using the same lines with a place called Wunstdorf, which lies just um, outside Berlin, not actually far from here, a place which would be originally designed opening in 1939 at the beginning of World War II as this huge above and below ground communication centre for the Nazi war effort, for the Wehrmacht for the German army during World War II, a place where every theatre um, of World War II could be communicated with. That's then after World War II taken over by the Russians, so you had this crucial place, Soviet military uh, or Soviet aviation defence for potentially World War III in occupied East Germany as well as in Poland as well. So crucial these two uh, venues and they all and they both used 81 phone lines that ran not far from here over there where the sector boundary was um, under the Schönefelder chasse 81 phone lines would be the target of um, operation uh, um, gold so in 1997 
let's just fast forward, these houses uh, were being constructed and as you'll see also a motorway. So this is the motorway that was dug just down there where the tunnel is. That's where the Operation Gold Tunnel would have been in the ground they had to remove this cutting. And that's what you can see in Berlin now. And over here is the graveyard. It's then that this thing, this is part of a, the pre-amplification chambers of Operation Gold, a real piece of, uh, of history. It was then that this chunk of Operation Gold was rescued as they dug the motorway cutting just beyond the sector boundary. So it's always nice to have a little bit of this epic story. What we're going to do now is walk the walk from uh, this area where the cover building was towards the sector boundary. Now, cover building would be a radar station, and all of this place was decided in a meeting in 1953 between those with a need to know, British and American Secret Service agents, um, in a place called Carlton Terrace in London. Um, and they discuss, um, we're gonna build a tunnel in Berlin, we're gonna tap these phone lines, this is the place, and they start the preparation. Um, the problem was, in the corner of this meeting, taking the minutes, was our friend George Blake. So he said it was remarkably easy. He drew up a plan of where and the line of the tunnel, and um, he made copies of the minutes of the meeting, and he decided that one of the people in this need-to-know meeting who needed to know would be a man called Kondrashov, his KGB handler. He gave them all the information as they spent the afternoon after the meeting driving around London on the top of a double-decker bus, and Kondrashov, Kondrashov said after the, the Cold War, this is dynamite, and he gave it to his handlers in Moscow. They knew about the tunnel before it was started. Now all they would do was wait and bide their time. So let's walk those first metres here where the tunnel would have run. So just ahead of us would have been the sector boundary. You can see that's down there at the end of this path. That's where the motorway cutting now is. And the tunnel would run strictly a few hundred metres over there under this territory uh, before it went out of the west and into the east. Um, it was oper operational by 1955, so initially planning had to be built. First you had to get a line um, of uh, the tunnel and a beginning point. So back where we started, just behind us, they decided on a radar station. Radar station was ideal because not far from here still is Schoenfeld Airport. That was a um, Soviet uh, and East German uh, air base. So building a radar station to monitor that on the western side of the sector boundary was an acceptable cover. But this path here, this was the sector boundary and it would be just over here that the tunnel would come out under the ground, out of the west and into the east. It was just up here where the section of the tunnel was excavated where my pre-amplification chamber cable was. What's a pre-amplification chamber? The signal from the cable would be tapped uh, and then it would be amplified and cleaned up acoustically in the pre-amplification chamber to make it easier for the operatives to hear and understand what was being said. So we now crash through these bushes into the Soviet sector. <laughs> might be able to hear the motorway, but it would have been right there where the chunk of the tunnel was dug up and ahead of us opening up in front of us. Now we get the view all the way down to the Schoenfelder Chaussee. So let's do a quick 180. Radar station would be here. All of the tunneling sand would be deposited in the basement of the radar station so that it wasn't visible as it came out in trucks, give the game away. The tunnel would then run right under here from the radar station, whole thing encased in iron rings, kind of like corrugated uh, rings that would then push through the sand. And let's see if we can get a clear view. Just over here is the cemetery. So this is the graveyard that appears on um, Blake's map. And beyond it, in the area there behind that wall, that's where the tunnel would run. And it would run under this area to the right of the graveyard to the tap chamber, which was right here in the road.
This house looks relatively modern, as does this one. So it must have been under where this house is, to the road, where the tap chamber used to be. So under this cab, and just over here, immediately to the left of it, so it would have been where those trees are. But if we look through this little gap, we can see that's the Schoenefeld Chaussee with the cars on it. So let's follow the line of the tunnel down to its conclusion, the tap chamber. So what information came through the tunnel from these two places, Karlshorst and Wunstorf? Some of it was very important. First up, uh, lots and lots of names, lots and lots of names involved in lots and lots of uh, Soviet military and uh, intelligence and military operations. That was important in order to get a handle on what the Russians were up to in Germany, East Germany, Poland and elsewhere. It was also important for defectors. So in the 1950s, over the famous spy bridge, you get Soviet uh, and so Eastern and Western agents exchanged. But to work out whether these people uh, were who they said they were, an increased number of names in various operations would have uh, been important in terms of questioning about those operations. Did they know these people? Did that tally with what the tunnel was saying? You know, hours and hours of it would have just been people chatting, generals' wives talking about this, that and the other, uh, their gardeners and um, affairs that they were having. But perhaps more importantly, information about the Soviet nuclear program because every gram of uranium, very, very scarce globally uranium, but one of the places that had it was occupied East Germany, and um, every ounce of those uh, of that ore would be sent to the Soviet military, uh, back to the Soviet Union. So information from the tunnel uh, gave a handle on that as well. Um, also importantly, weirdly, um, they found out from Operation Gold that the Soviets had been doing the same thing, that near Potsdam they'd been tapping a phone line that the British Secret Service had been using, or the British uh, occupying forces. So, one spy tunnel exposes the other. Now, talking of exposure, in 1956, the Russians, of course, knowing about it from before the tunnel was started. In 1956, there was a thaw in the Cold War. Khrushchev had come to power. He was going to visit England London for the first time, and they thought that would be a perfect platform to expose the tunnel. The problem was, how are we going to expose the tunnel without jeopardising Blake's position? Now, Blake's code name was Diomede, so literally diamond or valuable, and he was so highly placed that if they exposed the tunnel, it would have begun a chain of thought in the British and American Secret Service. You know, so how do they find out? Maybe we've got a mole, let's find him or her and eventually Blake might be exposed. So what they decided to do, and Blake said afterwards that all he had to do, you know, he, he was just gonna have to trust his handlers. They were gonna discover it accidentally. So in April 1956, with the scheduled meeting of the Soviet Premier going to England, they decided that, you know, it had been raining in the spring, that had been an excuse to say there were um, short circuits on the phone line, you could send some engineers down and they'd find it accidentally and Blake would be protected and the tunnel would be exposed. So. In April of 1956, the men are sitting down in the tap chamber, listening to wires that were only 30 centimetres below the road surface, heard an unmistakable noise, middle of the night. Truck arrives, truck stops, boots hit tarmac, pickaxe hits tarmac, so they raise the alarm. But the engineers, you know, they open up the road, they don't find any shore circuits. One of the stories is that underneath the phone lines was a trap door, and the trap door was locked with the padlock said made in England. That's pretty difficult to establish, but we now reach the end of the tunnel. So let's have a little look around. The trap door, with or without the Made in England padlock on it, eventually was broken through, and the Russians and East Germans dropped down into the tunnel. And what East Germany did for the propaganda value was invite to here, and it must have been because the cables were right by the curb. So it must have been where this taxi is. So the East Germans and the Russians drop into the tunnel, and for the propaganda purposes, I think what they thought they could do was to say, you know, look at this gangster act. But in London, they only mentioned American involvement, perhaps holding it over the Brits for future use. Um, either way, <coughs> the tunnel was uh, blown, uh, and it kind of backfired the propaganda, because at the end of the day, everybody loved the tunnel. Russians, East Germans, they couldn't believe the length, the technology in it the cheekiness of the tunnel, most of which still lies under this area here. Now, Blake 
still um, survived, but he was eventually exposed in the early 1960s by a Polish double agent who said, look, I reckon you've got a spy in your midst. In my sphere, he's called Lambda 2. You need to look and find this guy. The Brits look, they find Blake, he confesses. He's jailed 42 years, one for every agent he betrayed. That's the idea. Blake, by his own admission, would say that he betrayed conceivably hundreds of people who all disappeared and almost certainly lost their lives. But two years, 1962, two years after his conviction, he breaks out with a couple of cons from a prison in London. He's then smuggled, having lain low for a while, into Europe in a camper van. He comes to Berlin, he goes from West Berlin here into East Berlin, where he goes to Moscow, where he would eventually end his life at the age of 98, just before Christmas. That man died, and Blake's colourful life came to an end. But it's remembered by the story of Operation Gold that ended right there by that taxi. Epic stuff. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time.